In the last video, we looked at Michel Foucault's first book, Madness and Civilization, translated abridged from the French A History of Madness. In this video, I want to look at some critiques of Foucault and also ask, what is it that Foucault is doing? How can we untangle this difficult book and think clearly about what Foucault is saying, both in Madness and Civilization, and by extension in his later works. Looking at some criticisms of Foucault are a good way to try to pin down exactly what's going on with his method and his view of the world. So let's start there. Take one general criticism. In 1987, Historian Lawrence Stone criticised Foucault as being unconcerned with historical detail of time or place, or with rigorous documentation. He said that Foucault ignored enormous differences in the degree and organisation of incarceration from country to country in Europe. Another related criticism is that his analysis of the birth of the asylum in the 19th century relies on only two sources, and they're both from the Took family. And again, the criticism is that he ignores nuances and regional and historical differences. Now, Foucault himself said in response to Stone's criticism that he insisted in the text on the pronounced differences between countries like France and England. But it is true that he maintains that there is a consistency, a structure in the experience of madness across Europe, or at least across countries, and in specific countries. Historian H.C. Middleford has also argued that Foucault doesn't pay enough attention to chronological and regional differences. For example, Foucault argues loosely that mental illness was an invention of the 19th century, but Middlefort points out that hospitals for the mad were founded in Spain as far back as the 15th century. And during the 17th century, Foucault argues that the mad, the idle, the poor, were all treated as the unreasonable, and were confined together in what was known as the Great Confinement. But Middlefort again points out that there was no great state-enforced confinement in England at the time. In fact, private madhouses were developing instead. Now, Foucault does mention these institutions, and he's defended himself by pointing this out. But if we accept that there are differences in attitudes to the mad across Europe, does this invalidate Foucault's argument? And this leads us to the wider point. What is exactly Foucault's argument? To unpack this, let's focus on a single part of the argument, the Great Confinement. Foucault argues that across the classical age, that's the age of reason, the enlightenment, the birth of our modern world, the mad were confined along with the poor and the idle because of the period's interpretation of reason itself. Now, one thing that was reasonable was the morality of work. Since Adam and Eve's fall, God has punished humans with the necessity for work. Being unable to work was both a sign of vice and a threat to the stability of the bourgeois order. The mad, along with the idle, the deviant, the poor, were confined then as being unreasonable. But historian Roy Porter has criticised Foucault by saying that this picture 
of indiscriminate confinement does not seem to accurately match what actually happened in England. Few lunatics, he says, were kept in goals, and workhouse superintendents resisted their admission. He says he does not find prominent in 18th century discourse the couplings Foucault emphasises between sanity and work, madness and sloth, and he goes on, less still was there any concerted attempt to put the asylum population to work. So how does this affect Foucault's argument? In response, Foucault might argue that there are, of course, epistemic differences between areas, including between France and England, then I'd say, of course, there are differences. His main point, though, is twofold. First, that there is some consistency in interpretation and perception across region or culture. And second, that this consistency is rooted in moral beliefs of the period. His main point, as he says himself, is that madness is rooted in the moral world. Now, of course, as I've said, there are cultural differences, but there's also cultural consistency that's often rooted in arbitrary rather than scientific beliefs. So this leads us to a wider point. What exactly is Foucault saying? What is he doing? Historians Arthur Steele and Irving Velody have written that to many, Foucault's work seem too speculative as history and too empirical to be philosophy. That is, he seems focused on abstract philosophical premises like reason and unreason and historical record at the same time. Steele and Velody continue by saying that what is peculiar about madness and civilization is the attempt to write a history of both concepts and institutions without much distinction between the two. So what exactly is going on here? I'm going to try and make this as precise as possible. Foucault himself writes that to write the history of madness will therefore mean making a structural study of the historical ensemble, notions, institutions, judicial and police measures and scientific concepts. And to expand and make this a bit clearer, the historian George Rosen in his Madness in Society has written that at any given period, certain criteria are employed to establish normal human nature, as well as any deviation from it. So what terms do we have here? We have certain criteria, we have human nature, we have deviation. So in short, Foucault is searching for these criteria that establish what is normal and how those criteria change over time. Now, the criteria usually form a system so that they're consistent. We saw this in confinement, sin, bourgeois work, madness, animality, poverty. They all worked together. They are compatible in a conceptual framework. We might also think of them more simply as attitudes, perceptions, and sensibilities. Now, later Foucault would call this an episteme. The experience of madness in the classical ages episteme was bound up in ideas about the morality of work, the morality of the family, the morality of religion, including things like black magic and sexual deviancy. Foucault writes that confinement, that massive phenomenon, the signs of which are found 
all across 18th century Europe. Throughout Europe, confinement had the same meaning. Here we have phenomenon, signs, and meaning, and they all work together to create consistency, while there is also obviously ambiguity between them. But he wants to let classical culture formulate in its general structure the experience it had of madness, an experience which crops up with the same meanings in the identical order of its inner logic, in both the order of speculation and the order of institutions, in both discourse and decree, in both word and watchword, wherever in fact a signifying element can assume for us the value of a language. Let's reiterate. Human nature, criteria, consistency, compatibility, conceptual framework, attitudes, perceptions, sensibilities, and of course, deviation. So to roughly define what Foucault is doing here, we might say that a Foucauldian method is an attempt to identify the consistent and compatible signs that produce conceptual frameworks and set the criteria for what normal human nature is at any given time, while broadly depicting the dominant attitudes, perceptions, and sensibilities any given society holds. Together, these phenomena form epistemes of beliefs that historically have changed over time. Okay, but to conclude, I'd like to return briefly to the ship of fools, because it also highlights some nuances and problems in Foucault's method. Remember that Foucault argued that during the Middle Ages, the mad were potentially treated more humanely in some ways because they were thought of as bearers of a kind of divine wisdom and were simply banished, sometimes on ships of fools, rather than condemned or confined or thought of as medical objects. One early criticism questioned Foucault's assertion that the mad led an easy, wandering life in the Middle Ages. But this was soon found to be a mistranslation. He never suggested their lives were easier. But Foucault does suggest, I think, that the mad led not an easy life, but maybe were perceived in a way that could be described as morally superior than today or than the Enlightenment. There was an openness to the idea of folly and unreason. So was this the case? Well, this has been said to be one of Foucault's greatest errors. There's no record outside of fiction of these ships actually existing. Eric Middleford, that historian we met earlier, has said that occasionally the mad were indeed sent away, but nowhere can one find reference to real boats or pilgrims in search of their reason. And similarly, Gary Gutting, another historian, dismisses Foucault's romanticization of pre-modern madness. But in a wonderful short study, Anne Koning has argued that the mad were still banished from cities and often sent away by the river, which probably underpins the popularity of the Ship of Fools novel that was published in the 15th century. Furthermore, Foucault's primary point is the identification of madness with the moral order whether that's divine wisdom or the significance of using rivers as transportation, what that might mean. Now, whether this weakens Foucault's argument is up for interpretation, but he's not saying that different epistemes are 
better or worse than others by some objective measure. His main point in studying epistemic problems, as he himself says, is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous, which is not exactly the same as bad. If everything is dangerous, then we always have something to do. So my position leads not to apathy, but to a hyper and pessimistic activism. I think that the ethico-political choice we have to make every day is determine which is the main danger.